a very good morning to you all. Uh, we thank you for attending today's webinar. It's a pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, Mr. Hari Krishnan. Uh, Hari Krishnan graduated from uh, Vesavi College of Engineering, affiliated to Osmania University in civil engineering in two, year 2000 and obtained his master's degree in geotechnical engineering from IIT Madras. He pursued his master thesis at University of Karlsruhe at Germany in the year 2002. He joined Keller Group in 2002, the same year, and has been involved with the design and construction of several infrastructure projects in Singapore, Malaysia, and India. He worked as engineering manager at Keller Malaysia until 2008, and worked and is now working at Keller India since that year. So he's still with Keller. He's presently working as the managing director of Keller India Business Unit. Uh, I just like to add, he's a very busy person. Uh, it's 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 really nice to have him here. And his area of interest, which include heavy foundation uh, solutions using board piles, driven piles, diaphragm walls, uh, retention systems marine foundations and ground improvement solutions using vibro techniques, uh, deep soil mixing, grouting techniques and ground anchors. Uh, he would be speaking today on, uh, on, on some of these topics, including deep soil mixing and grou grouting techniques. Uh, incidentally, we, we had scheduled this uh, webinar for our own uh, postgraduate students because this is a part, this is, they have a regular course on ground improvement so we kind of uh, have clubbed it with the Mumbai chapter so to, to widen the uh, audience presence and uh, to, uh, to make sure, you know, we take the maximum benefit of uh, having Hare Krishna here. So, uh, Hare Krishna, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Ashish, uh, for that kind introduction. I uh, really appreciate uh, your initiative uh, to invite uh, me, uh, though, you are saying I'm a busy person, but it's my pleasure always uh, to share our knowledge, whatever we land at the Keller uh, portfolio. So it's uh, wonderful to have uh, this today's uh, webinar. So uh, I, allow me to share my screen, uh, then uh, we can get into the presentation. I hope uh, my screen is visible to the forum. It's clear, it's visible. And I hope uh, my voice and the video is also clear enough. Yes, very clear. Okay. So, uh, so welcome one and all, and uh, I'm sure uh, students and uh, practicing engineers and academic academicians, uh, everybody may be having a good interest. Uh, so I, I would like to take this opportunity to cover uh, today's uh, topic, uh, which is basically covering the binder-based ground improvement technologies. Uh, I don't seem to have a moving the slide one second. Okay, is it moving to all of you? Yes. Okay. So uh, when it comes to the ground improvement family, uh, traditionally we have a several ground improvement techniques, uh, what is called flexible ground improvement techniques. So uh, the way virtue of the design and application of these ground improvement techniques uh, is made in such a way uh, that, you know, uh, we, there is a versatility of flexibility, but it also comes with some kind of a performance uh, related uh, uh, not issues exactly, but uh, maybe the satisfying the required criteria when it comes to performance of these flexible ground improvement techniques. So in my today's talk, I'm going to focus on a binder based ground improvement technologies where there is, uh, where there is, uh, uh, in terms of performance criteria, it could be a stability problem, especially for unloading cases where you have a stringent stability requirements. And then there is uh, some requirement of rigidity in the ground improvement techniques. 
or it could be permeability issue, which normal ground improvement techniques will not be able to address. So the binder based ground improvement techniques once again has an edge of uh, uh, advantage to offer such a required uh, impervious to the uh, geotechnical application. It could be soil arching, once again, a very unique uh, problem that we face, especially in tunneling projects. So some of these applications, uh, when you make use of the binder based ground improvement techniques, we will be able to achieve a desired uh, uh, performance criteria and desired uh, geotechnical application. So contents of uh, today's talk is I'll take you to overview of this binder based ground improvement technologies, and then uh, I will cover the application. But more importantly, having a case study for each of these applications uh, covering technologies like a deep soil mixing, uh, jet grouting, compaction grouting, and permeation grouting. And finally, some, some in summary, some concluding remarks. So as uh, Professor said, uh, any questions that you have, you may want to put on the chat box or a Q&A session in the webinar forum. So towards the, at the end, I will ensure uh, we have enough time um, so out of the one and a half hour slot, I would like to finish maybe in one hour, 15 minutes. The last 15 minutes, we can have the uh, Q&A session, which will be, I think, uh, very important for today's webinar. So uh, looking at the overview in the first place, um, the, this is the like, you know, overall ground improvement family, what you can see. Uh, they're all categorized based on the, you know, the physics behind, uh, for example, the consolidation. Uh, or the binder mist is the second column that you can see, or a densification, uh, many vibro techniques uh, that uh, we normally execute, and uh, reinforced basis like vibro stone column is another uh, famous uh, category, and others. So in today's forum, we are going to talk about this binder based ground improvement techniques covering these uh, four technologies. So this is very good, uh, important illustration uh, to understand where is this differentiation with the binder based ground improvement techniques if you can see the two envelopes here one is the blue and the other one is the light gray the blue is basically normal ground improvement and um, and the light gray is uh, very rigid like a piling solution so as you can see in horizontal axis with the increasing loads general trend is to have increasing settlements which is denoted in the vertical axis y axis so if you can uh, see there is a yellow color which is gi with the binders and there is uh, uh, without binders and there is a green color gi with uh, with uh, with binders so the point number 1 with the high settlements uh, if you wanted to bring it down to 2 and the point number 1 dash to if you want to bring it down to 2 dash what we call is equally possible solutions as good as the piled solution when it needs to control the settlements criteria as the performance. Then, um, you know, if you use a ground improvement solution with the binders, like for example, deep soil mixing and jet grouting in as contrast to uh, the, the without binders like vibro compaction or vibro replacement, you will be able to achieve the desired, uh, you know, performance criteria, for example, settlement criteria, uh, which is, uh, you know, often um, the concern for some of the uh, specific applications where you need to control the settlements uh, of the foundations. So this is a one quick illust illustration where the ground improvement with binders can play a, a better application in the geotechnical engineering design. Yeah. So uh, this is again a slide to show fundamentally what are these four techniques. Uh, if you see the first one is the um, deep mix soil mixing, but it's all about mechanical mixing. Uh, mixing the soil with a binder. I'll take some of the uh, more illustration in, in upcoming slides. Second is what we call is a soil crate, but it's jet grouting. You create a concrete kind of uh, rigidity out of the soil by eroding the soil and then in, in uh, and also having a turbulent mix with uh, uh, the grout. Uh, that's what the jet grouting is all about. Compaction grouting, contrast to the earlier two, you actually wanted to densify the soil. Um, for example, arching application, um, for example, uh, you know, the densification of the loose deposits. So here, very thick mortar will be used uh, to densify the surrounding soil at a controlled rate of uh, pumping with, you know, controlled rate of pressure and also looking after the other uh, control parameter like a heave of the ground. And the last one is the pure uh, permeation 
um, uh, uh, permeation grouting is the application where you wanted to reduce the permeability of the soil. But again, you don't want it to fracture the existing wards. But again, a very controlled injection just to fill the wards uh, with you know uh, finer materials like even a silica gel. So these are the four types of the uh, technologies uh, that uh, will be covered in today's talk. So uh, some of the soil types is important to understand. Um, for example, jet grouting can you know, uh, applied across the all types of soil, right from the sands and the, you know, sills and clay. But of course, the erodibility of the soil do depend on the type of the soil, thereby the strength and then the diameter of the column formed will be uh, different. Compaction grouting, again, very effective in uh, uh, cohesionless soils where you have a, maybe a problem of uh, densification and it can form an effective bulb, but some sills also it can be applied. And the silica gel, for example, for the permeation grouting or the cement grout. Uh, again, they are more uh, uh, prominent for the cohesionless soils where there is a permeability problem. And if you want to achieve a scale of imperviousness, then uh, this uh, permeation grouting can be thought through. So uh, I'll take you all through these techniques, both from a theoretical background as well as uh, some of the executional aspects, including quality control, and more importantly, a case study uh, for each of these techniques so that one can appreciate what is the real geotechnical application uh, that can thought through here. So uh, this is again an illustration of what can be very soft clay uh, before having the deep soil mixing as low as you know undrained cohesions in the order of 10 kPa can achieve uh, you know rigid elements uh, with you know after the deep soil mixing with the mechanical uh, a mechanical mixing of the tool. Uh, into the into such soft clay. So uh, again, it depends on the type of the soil and uh, other parameters like moisture content and even sometimes the organic content do have a very prominent importance in achieving the required desired strength. So strength can be as low as 100 kPa as high as 2 megapascal in uh, good sands. Yeah? So uh, this is the process that you mechanically mix the soil to achieve a, a higher rigidity a, a out of this mixing. And it increases uh, stiffness and strength and uh, some scale of reduction of permeability. But when you have only permeability application, maybe instead of this can think of a jet grouting or a permeation grouting, depending on the soil type. But it has a very good importance on achieving the required uh, desired strength. So uh, this is a, a small illustration of a video uh, to let you feel how you actually can mix this soil with this mechanical uh, mixing tool. Uh, if you can imagine, um, you know, while making the cake at home, uh, you what you do is a spatula and then mix the flour and then mix the water and make it very uh, different ingredient of the powder to a, a it is required rigidity or consistency of the cake mixing, right? It's similar thing, but uh, you know, you are going to the required depth. You wanted to have a required diameter and you wanted to achieve a required uh, geotechnical performance. So this is the kind of a soil types and advantages. What is the one of the good advantage with the deep soil mixing is a controlled mixing, which means your return of the spoil and your uh, you know, consumption of the binder is under your control. Unlike maybe a jet grouting where the spoil is actually need to be more because of achieving the required uh, imperviousness to the ground. But here you have that controlled uh, improvement, thereby you are controlling the uh, cement consumption. And of course, the strength and the permeability requirements with respect to the type of the soil, and um, that can be designed for minimal noise and vibration when you use this technique. So uh, this is once again illustration. You can have a single shaft, a double shaft. Uh, after the mechanical mixing, that is the how the column being formed. Uh, this very important chart uh, to realize not every soil can achieve, you know, higher strength like one megapascal to two megapascal. That is possible when you have a cohesionless soils like the sands and gravels. But when you come to the more of a clay soils or or sometimes a peaty soils, uh, then it, the strength will be uh, maybe at at the level of even 100 kPa. So, uh, but but of course uh, the moisture content and the dosage of binder. Uh, for example, the cement content play a very uh, dominant role in achieving the required unconfined compressive strength of, uh, out of the mixing process. 
So again, uh, patterns, uh, there are um, various uh, patterns that you can think through from right from the single columns to tangent walls to grids and, uh, you know, cellular patterns and the rings or blocks or uh, lattice uh, patterns. Again, depending on the application, are we trying to achieve, you know, uh, liquefaction mitigation or a slope stability control or, you know, the application is just a vertical application for a settlement reduction. So the patterns can think through and the versatility with which you can actually mix the soil in tangents or with the overlaps or without overlaps. Many, many possibilities are there when it comes to the uh, uh, treatment patterns and the treatment depths. So let's take a look at uh, one of this uh, good case study. This is from a, a project called Pungal Waterway in Singapore. So uh, this is the uh, plan layout of the project. Um, what is this? Uh, uh, basically, to develop this, uh, you know, complete uh, uh, city environment, and then still having the waterway connectivity to the nearby rivers. So this Pungal Waterway posed a challenge for the unloading uh, application from the geotechnical point of view, and this unloading application, basically the excavation with required slopes requires uh, some kind of a ground improvement. So uh, this is the geometry of that particular canal. And uh, you can see that it's running over four kilometer stretch with a width of around 25 to 35 meters, having a depth of uh, uh, five meters. So, but with uh, very poor soil conditions, the required stability uh, factor of safety is not being achieved in virgin condition. So uh, the soil is uh, soft marine clay and it's going to the depths of, you know, uh, almost to, uh, 12 to 13 meters uh, where you need to have this, uh, you know, improvement of the soil condition to achieve the required uh, factor of safety against the uh, slope stability, especially in this unloading condition. So this is how the illustration of the design uh, the, for the required factor of safety of 1.5 uh, for, um, uh, for that slope stability problem. And then the columns are designed in such a way that uh, you can see the plan layout at the bottom. It's about a one meter diameter having a cellular pattern. Uh, so on the cross section, you will have extended columns right beneath the slopes. And at the base of the canal, you will have a shorter depth to, to optimize the solution. So wherever there is a deep seated circle of a slope stability problem, the columns are taken to the required depth. So that is how you can optimize and arrange the column patterns to achieve the required performance criteria. So this is being modeled as a thin wall to ensure that even that uh, unique cell on the thin wall cases, it is achieving a required factor of safety. And uh, you know, temporary cases and the permanent cases were checked uh, for the different factor of safety considerations. And this is the execution. You can see the base machine, it's a robust machine and having uh, you know, uh, the two mixing tool axis, having two columns uh, uh, capable of mixing of at the uh, same time. And that is how some of the exposed columns you can see, and the canal is in under construction. And these are the monitoring results uh, when it comes to the lateral deflections uh, during the execution of the project. Very good performance in terms of uh, getting the required uh, deflection to achieve, ensure the required factor of safety has been achieved for the slope stability of this application. And that is the completed uh, waterway, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, a very good example of uh, resolving the slope stability problem in under the unloading condition using deep soil mixing. Then moving on to the next technique, uh, which is uh, jet grouting. We call it as a soil creep. The name actually derives from concept called, uh, you know, you make a concrete kind of a material out of the soil uh, through this uh, turbulent mixing of uh, soil cement uh, uh, injection. So uh, basically, it's all about the erodibility of the soil with the high uh, jets of uh, grout that you cause an erosion and cause the turbulent mixing to form the concrete uh, kind of an element out of the soil. That's how the soil crete is uh, been derived through. So uh, here, the wide range of application once again, you know, but again, the diameter, what it can form, you know, in gravel and sands, it can form as high as three meter diameter. Of course, in uh, clays and uh, sills, maybe the diameter need to be restricted to one, 1.2 meters. 
And uh, its advantage is, you know, you get a uniform degree of improvement as the erosion is under the control of the jet that is being used. It's a very powerful jet. You know, uh, you can, I'll show some of the slides uh, to visualize the power of the jet. It's a minimal vibration and noise that you can work literally very close to the existing structures as well. Um, but, you know, it will produce uh, some kind of a, a, a backflow because you are applying uh, the technology using the erosion concept. So the lot of erosion that takes place in the ground will be having a backflow. But the, having a good backflow will give a very good control over the quality control because you can actually do a lot of testing uh, sampling from that backflow. Uh, and then you can assure that required strength and the permeability has been achieved from that backflow samples. So there are various types again, single, double, triple, and uh, D system is very commonly used, uh, which is having a large diameter application where the grout is actually being uh, having a shrouded with the air pressure. And that will give, you know, much more longevity of the reachability from the center of the exit of the nozzle to uh, achieve the required diameter of the jet grouting. So again, the scale of erodibility is uh, very important to design the jet grouting to right diameter. Um, you know, highly erodible soils like sands, uh, you can achieve uh, high diameters even as high as two to three meters uh, with a D system with a very powerful pump. And uh, towards uh, right hand side where you have uh, less erodible soils like silts and clays, where the diameter need to be uh, limited in the design. So again, the applications can, you know, having a joint of seals or a bottom slabs where you have a uplift uh, problem to arrest a tension problem below the slabs, and it can be cut off walls uh, to, through the, you know, copper dams and uh, our main dams and the shaft supports. It can be a foundation modification like an underpinning of a, a world historical, uh, uh, which we commonly use in Europe for many historical buildings uh, to protect and then underpin the existing foundation or a tunnel protection. So a uh, case study is from India where we have successfully introduced this technology for a large dam project in Pulavaram. This is uh, one of the national projects that's currently ongoing in our country. Uh, this is the background of the project uh, where you can see the center, what is called is the ECRF dam, that, that's the main dam, Etcom Rockville Dam, having a span of around 2.3 kilometers. And uh, in order to construct this main dam, two copper dams were thought through. One is on the upstream, uh, spanning around 2.3 kilometers, and then downstream around 1.6 kilometers from uh, left bank to the right bank of this Godavari River. On towards left side, you can see spillway, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, to divert the river uh, once these copper dams are in place, so that the enabling of the main dam can progress. So uh, this is the detailed uh, view of that thing, and you can see the top line is basically upstream copper dam and the, uh, around 2.3 kilometers, and downside is the one, uh, up, uh, downstream copper dam about 1.6 kilometer. The center one is the main dam. So uh, the challenge is uh, the river Godavari is all about sandy deposits. And if you construct this uh, both upstream and downstream copper dams without the cutoff wall, then uh, the water will not be retained to divert through the spillway or spill channel. So you need to form at least a temporary cutoff uh, until the progression of the main dam construction works. And then main dam, once it has been uh, erected, then the, 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 these copper dams uh, you know, uh, not having a much of an application in the overall project. So the soil condition in this project are predominantly sandy in nature, uh, cohesionless soils with the high permeability. So being it is a temporary copper dam, we don't want it to have, you know, full depth cutoff. It's designed in such a way the partial depth cutoff, like an upstream is 20 meter and downstream is around 10 to 12 meters. This is how one can imagine the cross section of the copper dam having a base width of more than 200 meters, having a clay core uh, in its uh, uh, body above the riverbed. But the below riverbed to have this uh, cutoff, the jet grouting application was successfully applied uh, to uh, about diameters of a two meter uh, with uh, sufficient overlaps. 
So we have, uh, you know, um, uh, used uh, D system, double cube system uh, to do this application successfully. And uh, the target permeability is uh, one into 10 power minus six meter per second after 56 days of the application of jet routing. So uh, this is again uh, designed to de depths between 10 to 20 meters, having a overlap of about half a meter. That is, uh, the columns are spaced at 1.5 meter center to center. The, the verticality of the columns are having a very important role in this uh, application because if the columns are deviated to the opposite directions, um, then what happens is the, the so-called the gap created between two columns will become a biggest weak point from a permeability point of view and the water can gush through. So what we did analysis is in possible worst scenario of inclination, having a tolerance to the inclination during the operational preciseness, then we would like to ensure a minimum overlap even at the depth of 20 meters. So that is how that uh, half a meter overlap at the top will ensure a minimal overlap of 100 millimeters at a depth of 20 meters. So this is how you can still achieve uh, you know, a good ceiling of uh, cutoff application as you, as you, uh, you know, uh, inject this uh, uh, jet grouting application into the ground. So uh, sequence of the process is uh, very important here because uh, one is the mixing itself a good uh, you know project we have used uh, several mixed designs and you know iit madras laboratory we have done a thorough research and development to ensure what is the right mixed design for achieving the required uh, permeability so important thing to note here yes strength is not a vital parameter but the permeability is a vital parameter so we have been able to make use of good amount of bentonite as the strength is not a vital uh, uh, importance, but uh, more of a permeability. What you can see is a large sedimentation tanks uh, to cause enough hydration to this mixed design. And that is all constructed at the you know, uh, bed of the river Godavari. And then you can see the silos and the pump setup. You can see the nice jet grouting rig, which is an operation towards the left-hand side. So this is the power of jet. Uh, if you can imagine that, you know, if you put our hand across this jet, our hand will get cut. So this is the 400 bars of uh, high pressure jet grouting coming from a very uh, micro nozzle. And this power of uh, jet is going to cause the required erosion to the soil um, in this uh, sandy soils. And that, uh, you know, rotation with a uh, right rotation speed and right withdrawal speed it's going to achieve the diameter of two meter uh, thing uh, with this jet grouting application. So the quality control in this unique uh, application, again, plays a very vital role. Uh, like, you know, what are the control checkpoints uh, from the quality control point of view? Of course, we have a, a computerized system. We call it a M5 system um, where you can actually control most parameters, operating parameters. What is the flow? What is the uh, pressure? What is the withdrawal speed? What is the rotations per minute? What is the verticality that you can that you are achieving? So all that uh, process parameters can be controlled through this computerized monitoring program. Then you need the you know initial trial to make sure that you are forming required diameter, and uh, that you are going to expose. And uh, you see that exposed uh, uh, columns, which are proven to have more than two meter diameter. More importantly, with required overlap. Without that overlap, whatever the columns being formed, then that effectiveness of the cutoff is not achieved. Then um, what we have is that another checkpoint is we have this rod systems where it's a painted rods with the erosion effect, the paint of the rods will get eroded. So you are very sure of what is the erosion that is taking place in the ground to double check that once again, that the jet is being able to reach out to that uh, error scale of erodibility in the given sorts. So that is another uh, control point. And as I said, the mixed design itself has to have a very series of uh, testing program. We have established a detailed laboratory setup at site uh, to make sure that the right bleeding of the grout and uh, right viscosity, right flowability, 
and then you know even doing the you can see the bottom right picture the permeability test from that uh, designed grout mix and the back flow samples at iit madras laboratory so that you are very sure the end output of the quality control and quality assurance to the required geotechnical application is safeguarded so these are the some of the test uh, results of uh, you know from a back flow samples the unconfined compressive strength although the strength is not main a uh, role here but you know because of sandy in nature and then we are having the uh, jig growing it achieved as high as 2 megapascal and some instances may be closer to 1 megapascal depending on again how coarse is the sand how fine is the sand and more importantly the permeability requirement of uh, 1 in 10 power minus 6 meter per second is uh, you know well above that limit is achieved it's 10 power minus 8 to 10 power minus 9 so you can see good success of uh, how a permeation grouting can be uh, sorry the permeability control can be brought in with a jet grouting application here so uh, that is a good testimony in this uh, project you you can see uh, during installation these are the two jane bricks uh, which we actually got imported from germany uh, in one single stroke it can do as the pass you know 34 meters um that is the power of uh, this uh, unique uh, uh, you know uh, rigs these are all rigs designed and uh, manufactured by keller in germany and uh, we brought them on a specific transfer of technology for this project to uh, have this cut off uh, application implemented at kolavaram dam so uh, what is very satisfying is when they expose this you can see nicely overlapped interlocked uh, jet road columns across this uh, 2.3 kilometers so the upstream and 1.6 kilometers at the downstream very nice overlap very nice cut off one can you know on top of this now the clay core and then copper dam is been constructed which safeguards the required uh, you know cut off wall application below the copper dam so uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, about uh, jet grouting one quick uh, check uh, professor ashish uh, is uh, i hope my audio and video everything is under uh, control and uh, speed of uh, delivery is also meaningful uh, to all the participants any comments uh, professor ashish all is good uh, speed is good <clears throat> and uh, we are doing okay okay great thank you so um, moving on to the third technique which is compaction grouting contrast to the earlier ones here basically the basics of compaction grouting to be understood very clearly this technique relies on a principle of displacement um, to achieve a required uh, densification but when we say displacement it is controlled displacement we don't want to cause unwanted um, you know shearing of the soil and fracturing of the soil where it loses its original uh, uh, density or original stiffness so whatever to the extent possible that controlled displacement is the objective of the compaction grouting how do we achieve that it's a low viscous low mobility material um, uh, sorry high viscous and low mobility material and the, we use a cement mortar uh, like you know one is to three uh, kind of a cement mortar so in achieving this basically we create a bulbs of each stage of uh, uh, injection that series of interconnected bulbs will cause you know required diameter of that compaction grouting but it is not a nominal diameter these are all interconnected series of uh, uh, grout bulbs i'll show some pictures to um, visualize what i'm talking about and so it's important to realize the flow rates have to be very low to cause not to cause that unwanted shearing or fracturing of the soil so unlike the other grouting techniques where the speed can be achieved with certain process parameters here the slow injection it's as low as you know 30 to 70 liters per minute and the slump is as low as you know around 70 mm maybe 50 to 75 mm so this is like a toothpaste coming out very slowly out of a desired injection point to cause that diameter of the bulb and then thereby connecting this inter series of the bulbs to form the column and then surrounding the columns again you will have a certain grid of uh, you know primary grid and the secondary grid to cause the overall densification or overall stiffness improvement to achieve uh, 
required geotechnical application, for example, the arching of the soil. Yeah? So this whole um, controlled injection and to achieve a required densification is only possible with a series of uh, trial and error or a trials approach at a desired uh, you know, site. So then no specific design that can call for a design phase, but once you do certain series of trials and adjust the process parameters in such a way that you know you are not unwantedly shearing the soil and achieving the further improvement or densification of the soil is the whole objective. So uh, termination criteria, as I said, the volume of the grout is the one thing that is what target volume that we can achieve based on its original strength and original density. And then, of course, the grout pressure based on the overburden pressure and the depth of uh, injection point. And then pre uh, prescribe the ground heave. You don't want it to, you know, cause unwanted shearing and, uh, you know, heaving of the ground, which is not the objective of this technique. So um, this um, uh, improvement can be achieved with a sequence of, you know, prim primary to secondary to tertiary grids once you have, uh, you know, de defined the process parameters. So again, the soil types, what is very effective is uh, uh, granular soils uh, where you can achieve, um, you know, good amount of densification based on its uh, original uh, stiffness, how loose they are, how, uh, you know, dense they are. But silt and clays are also, there are some application, but limited impact. So this is how that series of interconnected bulbs looks like. That is one column represents one series of interconnected bulbs having that arrow marks basically required amount of densification and then you repeat that in grids of primary secondary tertiary uh, to cause the required uh, application successfully so here once again a uh, 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 successful track record uh, from india uh, in uh, delhi metro project it's a place called the Saket, where there is uh, one ex existing abandoned uh, nala, uh, which is causing a lot of soil arching problem, as they are, you know, underlined by very loose deposits of uh, sandy soils. So this uh, eight meter dia tunnel was proposed with um, NATM construction, um, new Austrian type tunneling method. Um, then this uh, twin tunnels uh, for the Delhi Metro Rail need to pass through this alignment where this is uh, abandoned allies was exist. So uh, that is the cross section of um, two tunnels which are proposed about eight meter diameter. And this nala which is there to a depth of around four to five meters, having a top five meters, especially this man-made ground of uh, Hespidian values as low as four and five. And that is causing a problem. And if you don't arch this during construction of tunnel, the soil will collapse into the tunnel as the pipe roofing for this NATM construction they are very vulnerable if you don't have a good soil arching above the tunnel crown level. So uh, the, the way the soil arching to be addressed here, uh, if you see, for example, um, the series of uh, uh, different colors like the black dots and then white dots, they are basically represents the primary and secondary grids. The primary grids, after you achieve certain uh, controlled injection to the desired grout volume and pressure and controlling the heave, then you do a scale up, you know, post improvement test. If the scale up post improvement test is not uh, giving reasonably good results, then you put a secondary grid in between the primary columns. That's where actually the more controlled densification can cause. And again, secondary grid, you have to think through what is my right process parameters. So in this project, about 300 points were introduced, uh, having diameter of about 500, meter, 500 millimeters, and the slums were controlled to the scale of 50 to 75 millimeters, and with a very low flow rates of injection, like you know, uh, 60 to 70 liters per minute, and uh, total 400 cubic meter was consumed uh, to improve uh, this ground to achieve the arching application. So you can imagine the low slum on the top right, uh, top uh, uh, right picture. Uh, this really, it's like you know thick paste. And then normally grout means people imagine like you know liquid grout, like what I have uh, explained in the case of uh, uh, jet grouting. But here it is a thick paste, and this thick paste is going to cause that bulk 
and the series of interconnected bulbs with the required grids is going to cause the required densification. So once again, you know, monitoring of the quality control aspects and the controlled injection uh, points for the flow, for the uh, pressure, for the overburden control and the heap, and then whole thing is computerized monitoring and uh, that you can get for every column that you are going to cause into the ground. So uh, this is the post performance uh, results. Uh, once again, you know, the low SPT N values, which are dotted lines, and then uh, having a, you know, theoretical design line to achieve the required soil arching, uh, having SPT N value from as low as 10 to 20 is required, and achieved results are well above 15 to 20. So this is again um, a good testimony that you can achieve the soil arching application without which it could have caused a lot of collapse issues. And once you are into the pipe roofing for this NA team construction and the soil arching is not supporting, then it really causes a big trouble uh, to progress the tunnels, what is proposed uh, below the ground. So that's how the completed tunnel uh, looks like with uh, proper soil arching above the tunnel crown level. Then the fourth technique uh, is about uh, permeation grouting. So uh, here, the, unlike the earlier one, low mobility, it's actually high mobility. But high mobility, it's only to cover the existing pattern of the voids. So if you can imagine, there is a good amount of um, uh, soil, sands, and gravels, and like alluvium deposits, what is very commonly available in the northeastern Asia. Um, where you actually don't want to disturb the existing ward structure, but you wanted to fill all these pore spaces in the existing ward structure. And that is going to give good amount of sealing, thereby you required permeability application is achieved. So that is the whole objective in permeation routing. So the grout is expected to permeate through existing wards instead of you know, disturbing that existing ward structure. So again, the control points have to be very good. Uh, for example, the finer the pores, the finer the grout material that needs to be applied. For example, cement grout, cement-based grout can, you know, achieve to some extent of the larger wards application of the permission building. But when you really wanted to achieve the finer pores, then even finer material like a silica gel can be injected uh, to achieve that, uh, you know, finer pores to seal through that uh, the alluvium bed. So that is the uh, silica gel application in the permeation routing. So uh, again, the top to bottom or a bottom up, again, depends on several practical conditions at uh, projects uh, where sometimes the ceiling bottom up is a good application. Sometimes is the top down is also a good application. And uh, what happens in uh, extreme cases, once you do uh, top down completely, you seal this, so that you form like you know existing pattern of uh, sealed uh, body, then you go actually bottom up again to control the injection by shearing the existing body of a top down approach. So I will explain some of the stages also in the in the one case study what we have already you know successfully implied at uh, Tista uh, low dam four uh, in the upcoming slides. So uh, in theoretical action, you can visualize again this uh, nice graphic. Uh, when you inject uh, this solution, you are not causing anything extra to the ground, like uh, displacement or no densification or no erosion, like in the case of jet grouting, or no mechanical mixing, like in the case of deep soil mixing. You just wanted to seal the existing voids. That is the whole application and the beauty of permission grouting. So again, since it is more of a, a, a permeation grouting, the name itself, it is more for limited to only the cohesionless soils like sands and gravels, basically alluvium deposits. So uh, this is the Tista Low Dam 4, uh, where we have done the seepage control. Um, this is um, uh, Tista River uh, near Siliguri in West Bengal. And you can see how rough is this uh, river. It's very rough. In fact, in uh, extreme um, monsoon seasons, the whole thing gets flooded. So you will have a very limited period of uh, uh, season that you can actually work through and other seasons you cannot work through. I'll explain the Koffer Dam uh, concept here, uh, what you can see at the middle of the river, what application we are trying to achieve in the upcoming slides. 
So uh, this is the overall plan layout of the dam, uh, what is required to be constructed. And this is the stage one of a copper dam, the blue color uh, uh, line, sorry, the yellow color line. The stage one application, when you see it, um, what this cut off, uh, uh, cut off wall below the stage one copper dam will ensure the river to flow from the left hand side. Thereby, you are giving a dry working space to the right hand side uh, to construct the dam halfway through across the width of the river. Once this halfway through dam is constructed, then you actually close the left hand side, another copper dam with a stage two and the required uh, cutoff wall below the copper dam. Then the river can flow through completed dam portion on the right hand side and then the left hand side completion of the balance dam can be finished. Thereby you are achieving the full dam construction in two stages by having this two uh, staged uh, copper dam and effective uh, uh, you know, cut off below the copper dam. So this is how uh, that uh, cross section look like. Uh, the right hand side you can see Tista River and left hand side, for example, you want to achieve uh, dry working space to construct the dam and for that uh, below the copper dam you need to achieve a permeation grout cut in thereby the river cannot flow through this cutoff so that you will be having comfortable uh, working space uh, or construction um, activity taking place for the main dam construction so once again the requirement of permeability cutoff in this uh, more challenging alluvium soils is uh, 10 power minus 6 meter per second so again, uh, the technique is uh, what we thought across the, uh, the axis of the copper dam, we have made three row design. The two outer rows, what is denoted in the graphic here, L and R, left, right, left side row and uh, right side uh, row, they are being treated with cement grout, uh, with the permeation grouting. Of course, with the tuber mansion technique, I will cover what is the tuber mansion technique in uh, next slide. And then after we achieve these two rows, all the major void structure with um, uh, major pore structure is being treated well. But then there are still fine uh, grained uh, pore structure is left behind, which may cause a problem with the permeability requirement. Then the center row, that middle row, is being treated with the silica gel to address even that fine pore uh, treatment uh, to cause effective uh, sealing of a, cut a cutoff wall here. Yeah? So uh, these are the cement grouts and this is the silica gel at the middle. So the sequence is like this. Uh, once you drill through this uh, uh, very challenging alluvium soil, it has boulders, gravels, pebbles, cobbles, everything what you can imagine. So you need probably something like, you know, down the whole hammer, vortex drilling to have an effective uh, placement of, uh, you know, casing into the ground. Then after you have uh, casing into the ground, you lower the pipe, what is called is a tuber manchet pipe. So tuber manchet pipe is all about at a regular intervals, you have the space mechanism, which is having um, rubber membrane with, uh, you know, it's having uh, uh, void spaces for uh, injecting the grout through these void spaces. And initially these void spaces are not exposed. They are covered with a rubber membrane what you can see with, you know, the black uh, hashes. And this tuber manchet, once it is installed in the ground with the rubber sleeves and a membrane, then the casing is removed successfully. Then that um, um, body around that tuber manchet pipe, that is called primary grout, uh, where you, uh, that is green color body, you actually make sealing of the entire tuber manchet pipe with the primary grout. Then the secondary grout, when you pump it, you actually cause the fracturing of the primary grout surrounding this and the rubber sleeve will be broken and the grout will be injected in a controlled way uh, as we don't want it to have this grout to flow across the body of the alluvium. If you don't have this controlled injection, you are pumping a lot of grout for the sake of pumping and you are not achieving the desired application of permeability control. So it's just going everywhere, wherever we want. You are pumping here and grout may be going 100 meters down the line, uh, the stream of the axis, where you are not really having any application to have such uncontrolled injection. So then once that uh, shearing of uh, primary grout is done and you achieve 
uh, required permeability control once again with the stages of refusal, then you next level of packer to the next stage, and then you attack in series of all this Cuba Manchet series, and you form effective growth body surrounding this hole. And this effective growth body will be repeated at the regular interval, both in outer rows. And then the same thing will be repeated in the center row by changing the medium from cement grout to silica gel. So this is the illustration, the casing in, and then you have uh, a tuber manchet pipe with a regular interval of rubber sleeves. And then the sleeve grout, what is called as a primary grout is in place and it will now make sure that grout is not going everywhere within the control injection this sleeve grout will help through and these rubber sleeves are there for example at every 0.5 meter vertical distance apart and then if you wanted to inject at this particular place then in this particular place you place a packer uh, and that packer basically that uh, the expansion of the sleeve happens and then the rubber uh, sleeve will broke and after breaking the rubber sleeve, the controlled injection will ensure the body of uh, uh, grout uh, within that uh, reach of uh, you know, 0.5 meter. It is not going anywhere else because everything else is controlled with the sleeve grout above and below. And then thereby you are really achieving what is uh, required. Again, these are all you know, automatic uh, injection containers. You can program the injection stage at every interval. Uh, both vertically and horizontally to the required pressure, to the required flow, to the required, uh, uh, you know, uh, cutoff injection mechanism um, based on the uh, process parameters. So uh, again, quality control is even more, uh, you know, uh, complex here because you are dealing with, uh, you know, silica gel kind of a material where you know, uh, right uh, settling time. If your settling time is not controlled, um, then the, the bleeding of the grout and the viscosity and then the whole objective of achieving a controlled injection is not achieved. So very high level uh, working uh, under the uh, under this quality control program is uh, important. And then um, the post performance, um, if you see, this is the river on the right hand, uh, left hand side, what is flowing. And the right hand side is already excavation is under progress and you can see it's a very good dry working space under the excavated body. And the this picture is uh, towards the depth of the slide. You see constructed dam already by and then river is diverted and this side now the stage two copper dam uh, is successfully in place. That is why you can see the dam is construction is coming up on a relatively dry platform. So this is how even uh, challenging river diversions can take place with the stages of copper dam, as well as uh, doing the required cutoff below the copper dam. So uh, in summary, uh, basically, unlike other geotechnical applications, uh, binder-based ground improvement techniques requires a trial and error approach and a site-specific treatment scheme should be adapted. Uh, it is not an exact science that you can design and then it can be, uh, I mean, the applications can be designed. For example, slope stability checks can be designed, but exact pattern of the grout elements, exact process parameters of the grouting uh, methodology that needs to be cross verified with, uh, for example, the, is the primary grid is alone solve the application or you need a secondary grid. All this needs to be, you know, having a trial phase of uh, initial site application to suit the requirements of a specific job site. Then the quality assurance and the quality control uh, plays a vital role uh, in achieving the required performance requirement. So again, I would like to stress um, in a way that, you know, when you wanted to do, for example, file solution, you are having a very low, less dependency on the soil behavior. But even in a flexible ground improvement techniques, soil dependency is there, but it has its own flexibility to check, adjust with. But when it comes to the, the binder-based ground improvement techniques, you are talking about permeability application. You are talking about, you know, a very stringent settlement criteria. You are talking about um, the slope stability under unloading conditions. These applications has very less tolerance for, uh, you know, error. 
uh, that is why if things go wrong uh, during the phase of execution, it real imagine in such um, you know river projects if there is a big problem of the cutoff, then it could be a nightmare to the project. So the quality control is a very vital role. I repeat that uh, stressing that we shouldn't you know uh, work like a normal application uh, when it comes to this uh, specialized uh, applications. Then of course the experienced personnel and uh, specific process parameters, and then more importantly, the specialist equipment. Unfortunately, many grouting applications I do witness in India, all it is all about how much you pump in the ground. Um, but it is not that, unfortunately, to some extent, even the uh, payment mechanisms with, uh, with the commercial equation is being measured, what cubic meter do you get paid? But it should be, not that uh, you know simplified uh, it is not about how much grout intake went into the ground what application it really sold so these specialist equipment and the personnel and then specific process parameters will ensure the overall success of the uh, uh, of these techniques and we do have a long track record with the proven performance that is why the versatility of the scale of application uh, can be you know, designed and then uh, applied and then executed to the required uh, uh, scale of performance. And overall, it also provides cost-effective solutions. For example, um, you know, um, that, that project of uh, Pulavaram Dam, original solution thought about you know, sheet pile cutoff wall below the copper dam. And steel being such an expensive uh, uh, thing for uh, such a temporary cutoff works, and compared to compared to this jet routing, it found to be more cost-effective alternative solution. So um, it looks uh, uh, from a scale of convention solutions, and if you embed this uh, alternative solutions with the cost effectiveness and the right approach towards the quality and then the process parameters, I think we will make a big difference uh, to the to that particular project in the overall geotechnical application. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to conclude uh, today's session and I hope it is of some use. And uh, if you have any questions um, in during the Q&A session, more than happy to address them. If you are not having uh, time to raise it up now, um, please reach out to either uh, Professor Ashish or myself. Uh, we'll be more than happy uh, to revert back as required. So one and all, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hari Krishnan. Uh, we have uh, a few, quite a few questions in the chat window. Uh, if it's all right, shall I read out, read them out for you, or, or you want to? Uh, yeah, that will be great if you can moderate it. Can I unshare my screen so that I can? Uh, uh, do I need to get into these slides? Uh, you can if you want, but as of now, even the thank you slide looks wonderful. It looks good to all. Okay. So, if it's if it's good, I can uh, read out the questions. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, so okay, I think the first question is from Mr. Manish Kumar. He, uh, uh, very nicely presented. I I doubly agree with him on this. He has a question. In fact, this is uh, it's on uh, jet grouted columns. Says, does the diameter of the jet grouting column change with competency of soil uh, at different depths? So, the meaning is there a feedback uh, to the operator during the uh, installation of the jet grouted column? Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr. Manish. Um, I think, uh, yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, maybe I'll take that uh, jet grouting slide back in. Uh, presentation okay yeah so uh, yeah i think if i understand the question right the scale of erodibility is very much important with respect to the type of the soil that you can think of achieving what diameter but uh, the question i think with respect to the depth do does it have any bearing of the change if there is a, choice, a change of soil with respect to the depth for example let us say you are having um, sands followed by clay and again followed by sands. Then, yeah, in clays with the same process parameters, with less erodible soil, 
you will achieve a slightly smaller diameter than in sands. But then in such clays, maybe that is not a problem for a permeability or a cutoff application. But if there is no change in uh, soil type, like radical change from soil, like sands to clay, you can uh, control the diameter uh, more or less to almost level of uh, same degree of uniformity from top to bottom. And other variability is, let us say, loose sands and dense sands within that cross section of the depth. Then what we vary is the operating process parameters. For example, withdrawal speed, what is required uh, in dense sand may be different from the loose sands. Then you may end up, let us say, in more erodible soils like loose sands, 2.5 meter, but you uh, wanted a minimum two meter diameter. Then dense sands, you target what is achieved as a two meter. Then not to make too complicated to the operator who is not that technically you know, qualified, but if you wanted to design the based on the worst condition, on the dense sand, if you want to achieve a two meter diameter, you fix up that withdrawal speed and then operate from the bottom to the top to achieve the required uh, to achieve the required uh, diameter. What is envisaged? I hope uh, I addressed that question to Mr. Manish. Yeah, thank you. There's uh, one more question. There are two questions from uh, Mr. Partha S. Sen Gupta. So Mr. Sen Gupta asked the question one is. Uh, it is understood from your presentation that in compaction grouting, the soil is displaced by cement paste. So if I understand that it is not densification, then where does the soil go when an area of land is treated with this method? Okay, so I will like to clarify once again. It is the it is the question of. Uh, uh, it is the question of compactability and densification of the soil. So when you inject this uh, very uh, low slump and uh, you know a high viscous material like a paste material into the ground and then causing series of interconnected bulbs, the objective is while having two series of columns, soil in between two columns to have densification. We don't want it to shear it off. We don't want it to cause the unwanted heave at the surface. But idea of uh, the application is to cause the required densification. So in that particular track record of um, socket uh, NHM tunnel construction for Delhi Metro, the soil is uh, loosely man-made deposited without this uh, technique or without this application, the soil is bound to collapse. So having SPTN values, for example, five to six, and uh, it requires a minimum of 10 to 12, and to achieve that degree of densification, this soil arching is made possible with this technique. So we would like to densify to the degree of its original possibility, but not to cause unwanted shearing to lose its original stiffness or original density of the soil. I hope uh, I attempted to answer that question. Thank you. His uh, second question is, uh, can jet grouting or uh, uh, deep uh, soil mixing or compaction grouting be done in inclined way? That means not vertical. It is possible. It is possible. Uh, in fact, uh, the compaction grouting at the socket uh, project we have done because of the overhead, uh, some transmission lines are going. So we have no headroom to do uh, that particular section of the work and we have done an inclined way in that socket project. Um, even the jet grouting, you can do inclined. For example, uh, I would like to take you to this underpinning works in the application slide. Uh, one second. So if you see uh, the, the bottom right, uh, the tunnel application, you can actually uh, have a sense of inclined columns. So there is a possibility to do inclined columns based on the application that is required. Uh, so it is possible. Uh, even in DSM method, it's possible inclined DSM columns? Uh, I, to be honest, I think there is a problem because it's a mechanical mixing with a blade. 
uh to some extent i think may be possible but then looking at the heavy rigs and then vertical axes and then twin shafts i have not come across uh, inclined uh, uh, dip chawl mixing but i need to check uh, some I, japan is the one country where they do excessive extensive uh, scale of dip chawl mixing application there may be some special application but to my knowledge dip chawl mixing is a vertical mechanical mixing but jet grouting compaction grouting they are all can be done in, in inclined patterns okay right uh, the next question is from uh, nitin tiwari he says i have a small question is question is how effectively compaction grouting can be employed to improve the clay soil compaction yeah. grouting clay soil very good question uh, nitin ji uh, actually um, in clay soils if you wanted to achieve only compaction application with the compaction grouting it's not right fit uh, because i believe clays are not compactable and you only end up in squeezing the clay and causing the heap so uh, so strictly compaction grouting is more for cohesionless soils where you need to densify uh the soils to achieve the required application but in some scale of sills not exactly clays it's a mixed uh, uh soils like you know sandy uh sills and silty sands this technique can find its space uh if it is pure clay then firstly the, it's not compactable then it, but if you have some other uh, application of uh, you know load carrying elements and then this is a low head room and uh, this is the best way to have the compaction and there are different considerations but purely on application of densification or compaction i don't think uh, 100% clays can be having this technique yeah thank you so this uh, uh, another you can question. see that you can see that on that soil type suitable slide slide number 50 um, where very limited application uh, for sills and clay yeah there thank is, you uh, uh, there is another question uh, uh, it's from uh, kuldeep uh, he says a uh, uh, great presentation i agree uh, and the question one uh, he has uh, two questions i think the first one is can we use high mobility cement uh, cement mortar with required strength in compaction grouting method as by doing so uh, i mean he thinks the amount of time required by process can reduce so uh, the yeah, good question so basically speed of construction is always been desired in every process but unfortunately compaction grouting is a slow technique slow technique in the sense uh the coated slow technique see once you put a high mobility grout and uh, basically you wanted to pump faster let us say why not 200 liters per minute why to restrict to 70 liters per minute so it's a high mobility and you can achieve higher productivity and you can finish faster but what happens then the high mobility grout is going to cause high level of shearing to the existing structure of the soil so the virgin soil what is already good with certain density and certain stiffness is being lost and then whatever the improvement we cause maybe it is just to pack up patch up what is lost not achieving on top of what is naturally exist so in order to achieve a required uh, you know uh, the application or effectiveness of the compaction grouting it needs a high level of discipline to make sure it's low mobility grout high viscous material thick paste very low slum uh, injected in a controlled slow injection uh, what we use is a pump with strokes so for example each stroke is like a 25 liters of a grout that will control we wanted in one minute not more than two to three strokes two to very slow injection though you form this bulk at a desired control injection the moment you do tuk tuk that's it the grout it way it shears the surrounding soil it is not achieving the its desired application so um, in contrast with uh, several speed 
of techniques, the compaction protein cannot be treated in the same view. It has to be viewed with a different lens. Then only you will achieve the required uh, performance study. Right, thank you. So uh, before I continue, it's just uh, to let the participants know that uh, uh, you can also raise your hand. There is an option to raise hand in case you would like to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question or discuss, uh, you know, uh, uh, personally or verbally. So instead of me reading them out, so that option is still there. Okay. Uh, uh, there's another question by uh, Mr. Kuldeep. I think Kuldeep has two more questions. The second one is on uh, the Singapore case study uh, of uh, jet grouting. The question is why the depth of column just below the canal uh, was less than the column depth around the canal. Actually, that was not jet grouting. It was a deep soil mixing. I will take that cross section of uh, Pongal waterway. Yeah. So, what is the question? Uh, if you can help me, Professor Ashish. Yeah, it says the depth of column below the uh, uh, canal it seems to be less than the column length, uh, which is uh, around the canal. So, so the, you see in the center column... portion, in the center portion, the depth is the light color is slightly yeah. smaller than the surrounding one. Right. So it all depends on the pattern of the how uh, the slope stability failure for this unloading application was talked through. So below the slope, uh, you have a deep seated failure. That is why you need to extend these columns below the slope uh, to a deeper degree as almost going 13 meters from level of 100 to 87. Whereas uh, the so-called curtain or shoulders or below the base of the canal itself, it is not having any slope stability problem. So you can optimize the scheme of the cellular pattern wherever it is required to go to a deeper depth to cut off that uh, deep seated failure. And wherever it is can be optimized, then you just form that shoulder. So in that way, you both economically optimize it instead of uniform depth and also satisfy the technical requirements. So that is what this, uh, you know, slope stability analysis was thought through. And accordingly, it was planned to have uh, that uh, pattern of uh, black pattern of uh, uh, you know shoulder uh, with the deeper columns below the slopes and uh, relatively shallow depth uh, uh, outside the slopes. Yeah, he has one more question, but just just before I can add on, put in mind if you permit, I just have one thing. Please. You have uh, discussed the uh, cutoff wall and the permeability of the cutoff wall. Uh, the desired permeability, I think that was 10 per minus 6 meter per second, if I remember, and you yeah. achieved minus 8 and 9. Now, yeah. uh, minus 6 to, to uh, uh, I mean, my understanding is it's more like silt uh, kind of material where permeability is not really, it's considered as impermeable. Uh, was yeah. was the requirement so, uh, uh, I mean, it's, to me, it seemed as if the requirement by the client was on the uh, higher side if they're designing a cutoff wall. Yeah, it's again a uh, good question, uh, Professor Ashi. So uh, I'm just wondering uh, the units actually 10 power minus six meter per second. Um, normally they have, uh, uh, they have, let us say, if you wanted to go for a centimeter per second, a different number, but uh, in the, entire flow uh, uh, application or, uh, or a flow analysis, this is again a, not a full depth cutoff wall to the required degree. They, all they wanted to increase the flow length by having this temporary cutoff below the copper dams. So 10 power minus six meter per second is the target value, uh, what is uh, given in the project. And, but what we achieved in the reality is 10 power minus eight to minus nine meter per second. Is that make sense to you, Professor Ashish? Yeah, okay, okay. But I think I think I'm okay. I'll just continue. Hari, can, with may, the, I, uh, may I may I may I uh, add uh, one yeah, statement? Yes, yes. Uh, existing ground level, existing ground, uh, Professor Ashish, uh, it is having uh, 10, 10 to the power of minus three meters per second. So that is the existing value. So it's all like. Uh, 
medium 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 to coarse sand so river bed so like yes. like a complete uh, permeable soil so yes. that need to be reduced to 10 to the power of minus 6 that was the project requirement oh so now i see the, it's again yeah, yeah yeah so much so that's what actually uh, it was intended so however jet goating provided 10 to the power of minus 8 we could achieve that much that's very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, uh, Mr. Kuldeep, uh, his question is a third question. I just like to complete with that. He says, what is the material of sleeve grout? The, I mean, sorry, uh, the sleeve used in the grout. So it's, I think he's referring to the last uh, case study, which is uh, permeation grouting in Pistar. So the sleeve grout is basically as we are putting this tuba manchet uh, thing that uh, the body of uh, sleeve grout, it's, it's not really to have the permeation application here. The application is uh, basically when you put a tuba manchet grout and then this particular rubber sleeve needs to uh, break and then inject the secondary grout, which is the major main application of the permeation grouting. The sleeve grout is the general body, so we call it a primary grouting. It's a very low, uh, very low, con low uh, 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 content of a cement that is caused just, it's like a water cement ratio, something in the order of maybe uh, 1.0 and then cause this uh, sleeve grout surrounding the tuber manchet. So when the grout injected in, through this rubber sleeve, the grout is not escaped to anywhere else and it is completely sleeved. Whatever the drilling disturbance happens surrounding that tuber manchet, as we have used the case uh, technique, when you remove the casing, if you don't do the sleeve grout, uh, the grout is in, uh, escaped through this uh, uh, sleeve. That is why you need to seal that uh, uh, sleeve first before you actually do the secondary injection, which is the major application for the permission grout. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this one uh, question by, uh, I think I'll take up the uh, one which is a hand raised by Professor Vishwanatham. So he's, he's there. Uh, can you please, uh, VVSP, can you please unmute yeah. yourself and ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Hare Krishna. Excellent presentation. Hello, sir. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning. Fine, fine. Doing well. No, in fact, uh, it's very challenging. <laughs> Uh, I have a couple of questions. What is that, you know, in one of the slides, you have shown an earthen dam and with, uh, you know, a grouted uh, uh, portion as an impervious cutoff. Uh, can you just uh, put that, that slide? Is, if, I, if I can. Uh, uh, this, this, no, no, no. That, this, this is just one. It has just passed. No, no, okay. Just now you open it. Is the, is the, which is the... Which is the permission? Yeah. yeah. Not this. It's just uh, your one cross section, dam cross section. Yeah. This one. Next one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this particular uh, the Keller permeation grout. What is the you know the thickness which you are actually anticipating? You mean the body of uh, uh, thickness of the uh, grout curtain? Yes. Yes. So this body has got a three rows actually. It is not one row as it is. Mm. Uh, presented in this particular cross-section. If you allow me, I will take through the uh, first, uh, one more slide down. Um, so you can see on the plan layout where you can see left side row and right side row. They are mm. injected points with a spacing of 1.5 meter center to center. They are mm. injected with a cement grout to address the all the a wider pores problem in terms of permeability issue. As this is completely alluvium, unlike the polyvorum case where this is a, a uniform sands. But here it is complete alluvium having you know, boulders, cobbles, pebbles, sands, everything. So all yes. that wider void structure is being addressed with the two outer rows with the cement grout past. Then the center row, center row is being having staggered with these two outer rows first and still having a 1.5 meter, but a staggered pattern. And this is being injected with a silica gel at the second sequence. This is now takes care of the even finer pore structure to cause that effective filling. 
So Good. if you include all of them together, the body of grout body may be something in the order of 1.5 meter between the outer row to the outer row. But they are not full uh, treatment like a jet grouting or a deep soil mixing. They are like a discrete points of injection in a controlled way to cause the effective sealing of, uh, uh, of the existing board stuff. So this is for existing dams, isn't it? No, it is actually the coffer dam what is being constructed in temporary way as it is shown in the plan layout. Right mm -hmm. now, paper is flowing like this. The first stage one is the coffer dam where you okay. uh, work on top of the coffer dam to cause this cutoff. And there is an underlying rock and you socket half a meter of uh, socketing this grout body. Then this mm -hmm. is relatively dry river can be diverted from the right hand side to left hand side then the work can be progressed to construct the main dam with this dry working space. Then you do the stage two copper dam, allowing the river to flow through the exit, uh, constructed uh, spillway mm. uh, of the main dam. Then mm. do the, uh, uh, the left-hand side further construction of the spillway. So with that, as you can see in the last picture, you will be able to see this is how one side river is flowing, other side dam is coming up. And then still yes. constructed by allowing the constructed portion of the spillway, the river to flow on the other side. So this way, yeah. the stages of construction of copper dam with the cutoff wall, then facilitates the dam or spillway construction. Okay. So then one question which I have come across, uh, you know, if you are not using very systematic grouting approach, particularly in sandy soils, no? So yeah. generally what used to happen is that, let us say, a grout hole depth of... Uh, uh, 10 meters or 15 meters, the entire grout, uh, you know, goes into the sand body. You know, as assumed, you know, it will not climb up to the uh, lateral portion. Uh, have you done some, exhumed something, uh, you know, some portion and then checked the, the spread of the grout? Yeah, it's a very valid point. And the and objective of any grouting is not causing just pumping and then counting. Mm to you know submit your commercial bill the objective mm. thing is to achieve a required process in order to get a required desired geotechnical application successfully so every mm. site we do a trial a site specific trial what are the process parameters and uh, initial design parameters of whatever uh, diameter or depth is it achieved or not achieved and then do Pre and post, like you know, pump in test and pump uh, pump out test for the permeability or a backflow collection of that trial, and then check the grout strength achieved or permeability achieved from that black backflow sample. Uh, then only you go ahead with the main box. Without this site specific trial, without double conforming or validating the design or a process parameter at field, if you just proceed with the pumping of the grout, it may end up with for the sake of doing some grouting without achieving the desired application. Yes, yes. Okay. So thank you, Professor Ashish, and thank you, Hari Krishna, for excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, BVSV, for being here. Okay, uh, Hari Krishna, I have uh, two more questions if you allow me to yeah. ask. Please. Uh, the next question is from uh, Margi Dave. Uh, her question is uh, how jet uh, inject in jet injection velocity is determined for jet grouting. Okay, uh, so basically jet grouting has got, uh, let me take uh, to the quality control patterns of uh, jet grouting. So basically the flow rate, withdrawal speed, rotations, uh, speed of the rod. These are the three things controls the flow. So flow rate is like, you know, for example, 100 liters per minute, what is required as a flow rate. But at what speed we are with the drawing with certain rotation, let us say 100 RPM, the rod is rotating, which is the jet is being rotating to cause the required erodibility. And apart from this rotation, it's what speed you are withdrawing, how many, uh, you know, centimeters uh, per, uh, per minute you are withdrawing the speed. All these three, will have erodibility, that means jet is reaching to certain distance to cause the erosion. At the same time, it is rotating 360 degrees to cause the turbulent mixing of that uh, uh, grout with the natural soil and then forming the required diameter. 
So again, these process parameters are, need to be established through initial field trial. And then you will get a desired diameter and desired uh, you know, overlap, for example, in this particular case. You may achieve the diameter, but not having the overlap will cause a big, big spot for that cutoff application. So it's very important, the verticality control, the overlap control, the degree of rotation, the degree of withdrawal speed, the flow rate, all that need to be synchronized uh, to ensure the overall success of the application. Yeah, thank you. This is one last question. Uh, this is from uh, Mr. Jaydeep uh, Dhale. Uh, his question is, is there a method other than using TAM, that's your tube mesh? Uh, that's the first one, I think. And he says, uh, also, how do we ensure that the grout is controlled in the desired area? Yeah, tube mesh is... Uh... What why we prefer is a controlled injection of that particular sleeve. So we imagine if you don't have a tuber manchet, when you want it, even if you have effective packers, the within the packers there may be some loss of grout. But the tuber manchet having sleeves and the sleeve is covered with rubber, and that rubber sleeve only breaks when you have a packer above, packer below. So only this particular stage you are pumping the grout. Rubber is expanding. The sleeve grout, what you have, the primary grout is uh, broken, and then controlled injection is taking place. And remember again, this is the permeation grouting where we don't want it to cause any alteration to the existing structure. No mixing, no erosion, no densification. We just wanted to fill the voids what it has naturally content with. And that void filling through permeation grouting, if you don't have this packing of a tuber manchet technique, it, imagine alluvium soil, you pump, you end up seeing this uh, grout after 100 meters down the line. And that is not the objective of controlled injection. You're just causing so much of grout into the ground, but without having a desired cutoff application uh, in the desired axis of the uh, coffer dam. So uh, this uh, fever manager technique will really ensure required stages of grouting at required location. Otherwise, you end up doing everywhere the grouting in the alluvium soil without achieving the de desired application. Hare Krishna, thank you very much for uh, for your uh, you know giving us the time to be here this morning. I know you rushed from Porto to be here. It, it was very nice of you. You're in Bombay and still you you agreed to give this uh, uh, through a, a webinar thing. Uh, you know so that we can have a, a wider audience. To you know, to you know, listen to you. Okay, with this, uh, I I thank everyone to be here and uh, we close this uh, webinar session today. Thank you very yeah. much, people. Once again, I would like to extend uh, my gratitude in uh, in organizing this uh, session. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed. I think there are a lot of uh, value added questions, and I hope I, I added some. Uh, you know, knowledge transfer or a sharing to the participants today. And once again, thank you, Professor Ashish, uh, in inviting and uh, organizing and this uh, fantastic uh, efforts and uh, look forward to some other opportunities in the future. Thank you, one and all.